What does it mean when Jesus says he's the Lord of the Sabbath? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 12. All right, here we are at Matthew 12. We are cooking along. So Matthew 10, Jesus calls his disciples. Matthew 11, he starts to instruct them as what he wants them to do. This keeps going now in Matthew 12, where we're going to talk more about what Jesus means when he talks about himself and what's to come. After the initial instructions that Jesus gives his apostles, they go into a grain field on Sabbath and they are hungry. So they started picking up some of the wheat heads and rubbing them in their hands. That's how you can eat them. So they all started doing this and the Pharisees saw him. I'm like, what are they doing in the wheat field? But they saw him and said, you know, what you're doing is not allowed on Sabbath. And first of all, what they were saying was not true because actually Moses allowed people to do this. This was done in the past. And not only that, the Pharisees, because the Pharisees love rules, created like levels of work. This is work you can do on a Sabbath and this is work you cannot do on a Sabbath. And you know what? Getting grain to eat off of a stock is. If they were to use a reaper, like a tools or implement, that's not allowed. But this is allowed. And even if you don't own the field, you're allowed to do this. And he's saying, and this is where he's going to get in trouble with them. Quote, I tell you, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. There's that Hosea 6, 6 comment that he said before. You would not condemn the guiltless. Jesus is guiltless for the son of man is the Lord of Sabbath. Meaning the Sabbath is celebrated for him. He is declaring himself God at this point. And that was not going to go over well with the Pharisees. So he points out, there's a man with a withered hand. And so it, he asks them, is it lawful for me to heal him on Sabbath? And it points out that even in Sabbath, if your sheep, your animal falls into a pit, you would pull him out. You can do those things. And so he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And of course, Jesus heals him. And at that point, that was the end. The Pharisees were ready to destroy him. There, like I said, were laws about the Sabbath that they established about what you could do and not do on the Sabbath. And treating people medically was a thing you couldn't do on Sabbath. I mean, it's just amazing because Sabbath, again, was a day of rest for people. It was a day of rest to commemorate God in creating the world when he rested. But even when I grew up Jewish, and you probably heard my Small Steps with God podcast, I wanted to read a book. I wanted to sew something. I pretended like I knew how to sew when I was a little kid. And my family wouldn't let me. You have stoves that are for the Sabbath that you can turn them on before the Sabbath starts and cook your meal. And it will self turn itself off after a period of time because it would break Sabbath to turn off your oven. Did God mean all of that in Sabbath? Or did he mean it as a time of rest, a time with people? But instead, the Pharisees created these rules. I mean, you couldn't even pray for a sick person on Sabbath because I suppose they thought, well, that's our work. So if you ask us to pray for something on Sabbath, you're asking us to work on Sabbath. This is just not what Sabbath was intended for. And Jesus is telling him, I'm the Lord of Sabbath. And then he quotes to them passages that were coming from Isaiah. And he talks about this passage from Isaiah 42, one through three, where it talks about God and how he's, he's not going to fight. He's not going to cry. He will talk to anyone who will hear his voice or, and people are not going to listen to him. And it says a bruised reed, he will not break. He is going to get abused by the wicked people. And even though he is going to be a smoldering wick, it will not be quenched. And at the very last of that passage says, and in his name, the Gentiles will hope, the non-Jewish will hope. The next part comes in as a very uh, interesting passage, one I've heard a lot of, even when I wasn't a Christian. So a man was demon-oppressed again, blind and mute. He, they brought him to Jesus, and Jesus healed him. And people were amazed, as are always, is this the son of David, again, the Messiah? And the Pharisees again say, see, he's doing that through the devil. And because Jesus knows their thoughts, he says, that can't be. A kingdom will not stand when it's divided against itself. 
the demon are not going to be brought out by the devil because they're on the same side. But he casts out the demons through the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So then he goes on and he says again, whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. If you're not collecting the harvest, you're scattering the seeds. He says then about every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. And blasphemy means slander, revile. It's a very big word. So when he says every sin and blasphemy, every slander, every reviling, everything will be forgiven. If you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you won't be forgiven. The idea is that the Holy Spirit, the giver of life, the giver of faith, this is not just rejecting faith or rejecting life. This is slandering. This is saying evil things about the Holy Spirit. This is almost like a level of hate and despising the Holy Spirit that is beyond, I think, what most people hear about. I know that a lot of people feel that what blaspheming the Holy Spirit means. But I think it is a whole degree of evil directly against the Holy Spirit. He says, if you say something bad about the Son of Man, you will be forgiven. Don't, but if you speak ill of the Holy Spirit, you won't be forgiven in this age or the age to come. Talks about the fruit again, about how a tree has, a good tree has good fruit and a bad tree has bad fruit. We've heard this before. Brings up the vipers all over again, that these vipers say these horrible things, these evil things that come out of their mouth and it shows them what evil things are inside of them. A good person has good things coming out of them, but an evil person has evil coming out of them. And that's what he's telling them. It's a very direct message that what you're saying is evil and it means what's inside of you is evil too. And that on the day of judgment, everyone's going to give an account and every careless word will be justified. And every careless word they speak, they say something out of turn, they'll be forgiven. But because your words are not just a careless word, you will be condemned. Whew. Like I said, this got tough fast. And then the sign of Jonah, everyone talks about the sign of Jonah. He says, he calls him an adulterous generation. We think back again, Hosea. Hosea was talking to his people as being like his wife, who's a harlot, who was sleeping with all sorts of other men. He was making the direct analogy, which was true in his own life. You are looking for gods everywhere. You are looking for someone to sleep with spiritually, religiously. You are adulterous. You keep going on and looking for everything else, but you're going to see and there's no sign here except for the sign of Jonah, the prophet, because he was in three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Jesus will be three days and three nights in the earth. He explains what he means by this. The men of Nineveh rose up and repented after this. Something greater than Jonah is right here. Jesus is here. The queen of the south, that's the queen of Sheba, who, who came all this way to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And I am wiser than Solomon. I'm greater than Solomon. So he is saying, and this is all going to happen likewise. And he gives this analogy of these unclean spirits finding an empty home and then goes out and finds seven other unclean spirits, one more evil than the other. And then they live there. And that the person is going to be worse for it because the first spirit was bad, but everyone after that was even worse. And that's what's going to happen with this generation of evilness. It is going to go from bad to worse. And at the end of this chapter, then Jesus' mother and brother stood outside and wanted to speak to him. And Jesus said, who is my mother and who is my brother? It's a very famous speech. And he holds his hand out to the disciples and saying, you know, here is my mother and here are my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. When you're against the Bible or you're against God, everything he says, you take against it. And when I've heard people describe this, it's like, oh, his mother had been nothing but kind, did all these burdens for him, and he basically shuns his own family. He's not shunning his family. He is inviting everyone else to be a part of his family. He is making his family bigger. Again, we see the Pharisees attacking Jesus because of what happens on the Sabbath. 
We have the man with a withered hand who was healed. We have the man who was demon oppressed, healed, and forgiven. And we saw the man who was demon oppressed also healed. And then at the very end, Jesus and his mother and brothers were there to speak to him. His family was there. And so instead, he says, he brings everyone into his family. So in a sense, we're in this chapter too, because everyone who does the will of his father is his brother, sister, and mother. But then the big chapter message has to do with the Sabbath. And all these rules got placed on the Sabbath. I didn't like it either. I was kind of mad about it as a kid. And he is saying, this is not what Sabbath was meant to be. And by the way, I heal people. I feed the people around me because I am the Lord of Sabbath. I am the ultimate expert on Sabbath. And this is not how it was supposed to go. But then he also indicates that Isaiah, the prophet, talked about him and that his name would be a hope to the Gentiles. Once again, he tells them that you know people by their fruits, and these Pharisees and people around him, these towns too, not producing good fruit, and that there's no way he could be working with the devil because a house or city divided among itself wouldn't stand. So it can't be. He predicts, and this is where the apostles didn't hear it, and I think it's kind of interesting, that the sign of Jonah is that he's going to be in the ground for three days. And then will come back like Jonah came back and people will turn. Maybe the women heard it because that's why they ran to the grave, but the disciples somehow missed all of that meaning. And that unfortunately, this is an adulterous age of evil. People say evil things, they do evil things, and they reject him. And that's not great. And then at the very end, he extends his family to all of us, to all of them. He gives the image again of good fruit and bad fruit and the brood of vipers. He always calls the Pharisees that brood of vipers who strike out any time they can. They're filled with evil and they spit out venom because they are full of evil. He gives the imagery of the events of Jonah, saying just like Jonah was in the whale for three days, I'm going to be in the earth for three days and people will repent because of it. Talks about the unclean spirit, how people will start out with a minor unclean spirit. And the more they go down this road and get more and more spirits of evil inside of them, the worse they'll be. They were better off at the beginning. And he's saying that's what's happening to this generation. He keeps feeding his people, even on Sabbath, because the Sabbath is meant for man and that he is the Lord of Sabbath. He is God. And he is telling you what should happen on Sabbath. He indicates that he's part of the prophecy of Isaiah. He talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We talk about God and Jesus and how you can, I mean, you shouldn't, but blaspheme against the Son of Man, against Jesus, that can be forgiven. But when you revile, lie about, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, there's no forgiveness for you. That is a hard passage. I think that if you're confused about it, if you're wondering who it is, that is a great passage to talk to your pastor about. People get very tripped up on that passage, but I think it's meant to be someone who is just sheer evil to the Holy Spirit and die that way, you know, who never came to repent of it or, you know, but anyway, talk to your pastor about that one. That's a good one to share with your pastor. And that he wants us to know he is going to go on the ground for three days and come back. But we and everyone who does his father's will And even in that case, the Pharisees were trying to hold people to all these laws, even to the point of harming other people, which is not the point of Sabbath. Because again, they won't pray. They wouldn't heal. All these things that they wouldn't do during the Sabbath. But people, this sheep that falls into a pit, we would rescue them. Why aren't we doing this for our fellow mankind? But at that point, the Pharaohs became hardened and decided to conspire against him. And that some of us will have good in us because of the Holy Spirit. But those of you who don't will say evil things, have evil in their heart, have evil spirits in their heart. And as Jesus calls the Pharisees, a brood of vipers. But in the end, if we do God's will and asking for forgiveness and the things that Jesus tells us to do, we will be his brother, his sister, and his mother. I think my meditation for this chapter has to be over Sabbath. 
as a kid, I was resentful towards it. I was mad about it. And as soon as I no longer had to do those things, it stopped. I'm not doing Sabbath anymore. And just because I came a Christian doesn't mean that I should ignore the Sabbath. Maybe I need to take a more balanced view of Sabbath and consider it more. For my prayers, I pray for the people who are taken by evil spirits or have evil thoughts or even go to the extent where they may blaspheme something. It's a terrible direction for people to go. And more than anyone, they need our prayers. And what I want to share with people is I want to share, of course, the fact that Jesus includes all of us who does the will of his Father in heaven are his mother, his brothers, his sisters. That's amazing. Something that I think is attractive to everyone, regardless of whatever the apostles encountered, the mean towns, the people who would turn them over to governments for punishment. Same thing with all of us. What we lose in a family with other people and our relationships with other people, we gain with Jesus being part of our family now. All right, everyone, we made it through Matthew 12. I hope everyone's enjoying the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. And the website is finally moved. I have the domain for the Bible in Small Steps. I need a little bit of time to get that website up and running because as it turns out, running a podcast three times a week is a lot of work. So it will come up. I'll let you know when it's done. But now that this website is ready to go, I hope to bring more things, more features to this podcast. If you have any ideas of what you would like, feel free to email me. Thank you very much for listening.